Hello everyone and welcome to the second day of SAN's 10th anniversary uh, virtual festival uh, celebrating 10 years of our literary and arts journal based here in Berlin and also celebrating the launch of our uh, 21st issue which is um, including some of our favorites um, anthologized uh, within it. So today we will be having another session like last night. Thank you for those who um, are joining us again and welcome to the new people. Um, another session of readings and performances and art um, from contributors to this new issue. And uh, so it'll be in two sections. So um, we'll have an introduction and uh, a series of these performances and readings. Um, and I'll check in with you in the middle and then we can have um, some more. Um, so just uh, for those of us, uh, for those of you who don't know us, um, we are uh, a literary and arts journal um, made by the International Community of Berlin. Um, so we publish in English. Um, we also include translations from all sorts of languages and we publish people um, from all, all over the world. You'll be hearing a translation from German today. And we also have a talk with one of our um, translators in the issue, Alison A. DeFries, tomorrow as part of our feature um, with the editors. So um, we, um, and, and we really do see Sand as part of uh, this international community in this city. And so it's kind of a microcosm in a way, um, bringing together people from, from many different places and, um, and many different aesthetics as well. Um, so uh, one of the things we've been doing all weekend as part of the festival is we've invited everyone, including you, if you haven't done so yet, to contribute a 10 word poem to celebrate our 10th anniversary. Um, you can see the link for that on our website and the um, winner of a uh, person who wrote the favorite uh, poem, our editors, Emma uh, Lawson and Melissa Richer are reading them and we'll be choosing a winner tomorrow, which will be announced in our third session. Um, and that person will receive a discount code for 100% off um, anything you choose from our website, any of the current or past issues. So um, we've already had 23 submissions for that, uh, and um, I'd be happy to read a few of them over the course of this session today. Um, one of them by Suzanne, who didn't give her last name, uh, goes, Funny how muffled moans grow like mushrooms in the dark. And uh, there's also a place where they can explain um, their inspiration, and so I thought that it, explanation for this one was very interesting. This was inspired by a fling I had with a dude who was living in what was essentially a drug den, sharing a bedroom with two other guys. They never opened the blinds, so the place felt like a smoky time warp. And um, uh, also, I just wanted to uh, mention we'll be having a plug, sorry, we'll be having, I wanted to plug that we'll be having a uh, panel later today uh, with myself and a few former editors um, from the last 10 years talking about um, what it means to have an independent uh, literary journal and the different lessons that we've learned um, and somehow lasted for 10 years. So um, if you're interested in literary organizing or um, sort of behind the scenes of publishing, you should uh, check that out in a few hours. Um, so uh, to begin, I, I'd like to introduce our uh, one of our two prose editors, Melissa Richer, uh, who will be introducing the uh, writers and translators and artists who are in this first section. Um, so here she is, Melissa Richer. Hi, I'm Melissa. I'm one of the fiction editors at Sand, and I'm so excited to be able to present the next lineup of artists to you. I'm going to be introducing poets, artists, um, authors of fiction and nonfiction from Sand number 21. 
it's just really exciting to see what these contributors have done with the work and to see how it's transformed off the page. It makes me so proud to be part of the sand community and to be able to put such amazing art into the world. And I also wanted to take a moment to thank everybody for supporting sand. If you've purchased um, the digital version, pre-ordered a print version, if you subscribe, um, or if you've just donated to help keep sand independent, international, and weird. So, first up, we have fiction from Janana Vucic. She's reading an excerpt from her story, Vagina Gnusia. This is a story about a sea crab that moves into the narrator's vagina. This story captivated our editorial team because of how true it speaks to women's unspoken relationships with their vaginas, as well as how they navigate uh, that relationship with the outside world. Um, Janana is a Bosnian-Australian author. She's been published in a number of journals, and she's currently living in Scotland, where she's studying for a PhD at University of Glasgow. Next, Jaboya Odubanjo reads his poem, Brother, which is a really interesting experience for me personally because I just love to read and reread this poem on the page to look at the way it takes up space there and the different meanings that come from each line and from the lines and stanzas together. And it's a completely different experience to hear him reading it out loud, to hear the sounds and kind of the space that those sounds take up. So I'm just so glad that we can share that with you. Um, Boyega is a Nigerian British author, a roundhouse uh, resident artist, and his pamphlet, While I Yet Live, was published last year. Next visual poet, David Felix, takes us on a new kind of journey with his art video, which is made um, for his poem, House Fitting, which appears in Sand number 21. It's really exciting to see his skill uh, with the medium and just how he's interpreted and expanded on the poem from the page. We're really excited to be able to share this with you. Uh, David is an English poet living in Denmark. For over 50 years, his work has taken on a variety of forms and mediums on the page, stage, in galleries, and more. Then, Lucy Jones reads her translation from the German of POC Kuntzlime, Power Against Predatory Capitalism, or The Desire to Penetrate Potato Synapses Until They Bleed. That's a long title for a really interesting work that was actually originally performed by the author at an event in Munich. The author is Mitia Meded, and um, she's a filmmaker, author, actress, and Berliner. She writes for German publications Die Zeit, Die Welt, and Fräulein Magazine about the connections between politics, art, and society. Lucy is a writer and translator, as well as a longtime friend of Sand. Um, she's an important force in the Berlin community and has published um, multiple important German works as well as her own writing, which was actually featured in Sand issue 15. And we're really excited to be able to feature her wonderful English reading of the translation today. Finally, my dog was just um, poking me, but he's off screen. Finally, uh, we have art from Carrie Crow. Her photographs are from the series The Quiet Zoo, which shows us a world in miniature. For me, um, the confinement of these little worlds was really interesting um, to reflect on in light of the corona lockdowns. Really beautiful photographs. Carrie's work has been exhibited internationally, including at the 54th and 56th Venice Biennales. The Quiet Zoo explores um, if a photographic print can become a storied object in itself and um, how that photographic print can create a multi-sensorial experience. The photographs in this series are actually um, versions of 
the original photographs from a different series that Carrie did called Observatorio. She's interested in revisiting these images and placing them in new contexts and locations in order to explore their potential for dimensionality. So thank you again, everybody, for joining us today. We are so grateful to have the community we have. Thank you for your support, whether it be in helping us to make this event possible and submitting to SAN and making the journal and donating, etc. Have a great weekend. Hey, uh, my name is Janana Vucic. I'm filming from my bedroom in Glasgow and I'll be reading my piece for Jana Gwinusia in the most recent issue of Sand. Okay. At first I thought she was an STI, or maybe crabs in the plural. I didn't really notice her except for the itching and even that wasn't so bad. Annoying, sure, but nothing like that time I had thrush on my period. She was more like a tickle, a rustling of the pubic hair or a crawl over the labia majora. Real light like a mozzie, but without the bites. It got worse as she got bigger, and that's when I started catching glimpses of her, reddy, brown and leggy, scuttling across my mom's pubis like she owned the place. She was too big for crabs, so I thought maybe she was fleas, even though it looked like there was only the one of her. The tickling got worse as she got bigger. For a while I thought she was a spider, but at pinky nail size I could see she had eight legs and a set of claws too. Crab in the singular. By that time... I could feel where she went when I couldn't see her. Her hard little body squeezed between my labia and into my vagina, sharp legs pinching into my skin if I tried to squeeze my thighs together to stop her. She was stubborn about it and sometimes drew blood. But I could tell she regretted it afterwards. When I gasped and unclenched, she didn't immediately slip into the vaginal opening like I expected. She sort of hovered over the wound, maybe unsure or apologetic. She slipped on in when I bent to check out the damage. Two pinpricks of blood, mostly camouflaged by stubble. It didn't feel like much when she was inside me, but I could see she was growing and it probably would feel like something soon. I googled crab and vagina, but the only hits I got were about pubic lice and she didn't look like any of those. Too big by a long stretch. I wondered how big she'd get and if I should go see a doctor. But she wasn't really doing any harm and anyway, what would I say? How could I explain that there was an actual crab living in my badge? I tried to pick her up to get a proper look, but she wasn't having any of it. She'd raise her claws at me and sort of wave them around threateningly. She was small, sure, but she had a dangerous look in her eye and I didn't want to piss her off seeing as she was living inside me and all. I tried to take a photo instead, which meant spending a lot of time lying in bed, underwear off and legs wide, waiting for her to scuttle out onto my mons. I think she enjoyed being out from under my undies, all that fresh air. She'd scurry around, stretching her little legs and claws like she was doing crab yoga. Sometimes she'd take a nap, pulling herself against my pubes, her little body raising and falling without breathing. I finally took a photo of her sitting on my macroeconomics textbook and posted it to the Animal ID subreddit. No one replied for ages, so I added in an amendment. Found in Melbourne, Australia. A couple of days later, you slash modsy86 thought she might be a red rock crab. I googled it and the photo on the museum's Victoria website looked close. She wasn't the same bright red, her shell was brownish and black green in places, but it was pretty spot on shape wise. Plus the website said that red rock crabs are found all along the southern coast of Australia and so it made sense, geographically at least. The site also said that she was carnivorous and aggressive and would grow up to seven centimetres, practically a baby's head. A few months after she moved in, my period changed. It was thinner and lighter, the blood all pale and runny, the thick clots disappeared completely and I started buying regular tampons. I still got all the other symptoms, cramps, mood swings, cravings, but the byproduct was different. I reckon she was eating it. I mean, she had to be eating something. I started supplementing my uterine wall just in case she got hungry between flows. I'd leave a can of tuna hidden somewhere in my room, lid cracked open a half centimetre. I thought maybe she'd like the challenge of finding and retrieving the food like a dog with a Kong. She kept changing as she grew and I started finding bits of exoskeleton in the toilet. Fragments of carapace and leg floating in the water incriminatingly. It didn't hurt to pass. I guess all the moisture up inside me was turning it mushy before it made its way out. 
but it took a few flushes to disappear and I was worried about floaties rising up from the depths without my knowledge. Someone was bound to notice a crab leg in the loo. I mean, we were vegetarians. Okay, um, well, I hope you enjoyed that and thank you so much for listening. Brother, it's funny because the world is burning. This day is another. I wake up at 6.30. You south somewhere wake up. The day is itself. Metro become evening standard, become sleep. But today it's autumn. And it's been a court mandated 12 months, so you're driving again. The world is burning. I don't care, you say. You're going to buy a Tesla and we both know you won't. We won't make a difference, will we? Easy listening on repeat till it's smoke in the car, smoke in the streets. Put on the kettle, back burner, style, pinch of, peppered and taken with, three times daily. I said to him, I said, What your hush your want some? Get the hell and mind your own. Had enough my fill of Leave it out. Begin. Be gone. If, if, if push came, not a moment to. POC cunts slime power against predatory capitalism. Hi, I'm Atiyah Medit, and when I say my name, most people ask where I'm from. If I'm in a good mood, I say, from my mother's cunt. I'm a female ghetto lecturer, Aslak, a double B Balkan Berlin scumbag Kanak. I only trust facts not colonial ideological wet dreams thought up by the mistress and master race who for thousands of years has defended and consolidated its power by imposing mental and geographical borders. You must do this and you mustn't do that. You can set your toe on our piece of land, but only if we can exploit you for cheap labor and woe betide you if you don't celebrate Christmas. For those of you who don't know what Christmas is, a brief elaboration, Christmas is the first Me Too scandal passed down in written form. A rich guy with ego problems who lives in the clouds rapes a woman. Probably after slipping her knockout drops because she can't remember how she got pregnant. Maria, which is her name, has the child, Jesus, who later becomes a leading guru and hangs out with a crowd who are always going on about loving thy neighbour. Well, because I'm not into patriarchal esoterism 
I prefer to stick to the facts and say that I came from the origin of the world, a vagina. We should all rely more on facts than ideologies, especially when we take a closer look at where the ideologies of European borders originated. They were drawn up by European or royal families. The houses of Bourbon, Windsor, Habsburg and so on, a phlegmatic incestuous bunch. People whose brains resemble Gouda because that's what happens when family members exchange bodily fluids for generations and produce babies. My point is that these borders were made by imbecilic, spoiled, snotty men whose only full-time activity was being a son. But back to the question, where do you come from? No, I mean really. Well, if I'm not in a good mood, I say, from my father's asshole. I can really recommend that phrase if the person asking has bad breath or simply doesn't understand structural racism. We minorities have to protect ourselves and develop strategies so that we can extricate ourselves gallantly from unpleasant situations. Otherwise the vampires will suck us dry of our culture and energy. To all of you out there thinking vampires don't exist, I have to disappoint you. They do. They're everywhere and they love minorities. Germany needs us. The AFD needs us to incite hatred and be their scapegoat. It's too easy to always find fault in others and never in yourself. Without minorities, the AFD wouldn't exist because Germany wouldn't exist either. We helped rebuild this country and we're still doing it. The entire German middle class would collapse if all the care workers vanished from old people's homes, along with all the nurses from hospitals, the most Eastern Bloc illegal cleaners, unlawful hookers, cheap labour in brothels. When was the last time you saw a German builder or taxi driver? The German art scene needs us too, so that mediocre, privileged, white male directors have a topic they can finally get worked up about. And a reason to apply for extra funding. We minorities are mutating into exotic animals in boring zoos. But we mustn't open our mouths if we're exploited, stereotyped or labelled. The only good migrant is a silent one, particularly women. Women who open their mouths are branded as difficult, arrogant or self-righteous. Witch burnings still take place in the arts. Women are burned by having their voices taken away if they speak their minds in public. And the mind of a woman of colour can be very unpleasant because she's at the bottom of the food chain, a place where vital questions are at stake, like how to survive. Germany is also a country where racism or power structures in society aren't subjects that are taught in school. In Germany, it's more important to learn the rules by heart than to question them. And above all, it's important to be insured, preferably against everything, vet bills, legal action, death. It's important to keep a constant eye on things and on the borders. The question is, how safe is security? Does it save our lives or make us stagnate mentally? Because everything all of a sudden, our entire lives and interactions with non-Germans seems unsafe. I wonder how Stone Age people were able to survive without German insurance. Life's easy when you divide the world into safe and unsafe. But you can only rule if you divide, it's an old principle. Excuse me for moaning so much. Perhaps it's the first stage towards my assimilation into Germany. I also want to highlight the positive aspects. If Germany were all bad, people wouldn't keep risking their lives to come here. I too fled illegally under my grandmother's skirt. Perhaps without Germany, I'd be dead too, as are many other children at sea or at the EU's borders, protected by German weapons.
Hi everyone, um, if you're just tuning in now, uh, welcome to day two uh, of Sand Journal's 10th anniversary launch. Um, that was really lovely. Um, we've got a weekend packing, packed with readings, art and music, um, and that we just had the first half of uh, this second session for the weekend. Um, but all the pieces for the weekend can be found in the new issue of Sand, which is available to purchase uh, on our website and you can see the um, discount codes in between each piece for 10% off from um, every issue as well as the current one. Um, our printing was actually delayed because of coronavirus but we now have um, the PDF available for download and uh, immediately and if you pre-order the print copy will arrive in July and it is definitely worth the wait. Uh, our designer, Dimitris Gikas, um, has put so much love into every page, and um, you can see a little bit, uh, some hints here and there through the videos. Um, yes, and as we gradually uh, put together this issue, we were really processing all of the pieces in different ways over the course of this experience that we're all going through of the pandemic. Um, the theme of the issue is archaeology, but we were thinking about that already from a perspective of the present and not only the past. So the archaeology that we are creating for future generations um, and the various ways that history happens all around us. And uh, so it was especially interesting to see just over the course of the last six months as we put this together, how these pieces that we had chosen um, from one perspective, and maybe thought about that in terms of archaeology, uh, for example, um, the, the art that you just saw has a very archaeological um, element. So these were, these were photographs that were taken through a telescope, and then the photographs themselves became, um, after they were printed, became part of, of another project, which was then photographed. Um, so you can see sort of the ongoing layers of, of experience through writing and art, and, and that's something that we were thinking about, and then seeing actually how history uh, in, in the making has affected our readings and our viewings of, of these pieces has, has really um, 
changed the way some of these pieces come across and I'm sure they will look different a year from now or two years from now. Um, they already look different now uh, as the Berlin lockdown has loosened up over the last few weeks uh, than they did when I was writing the editor's note a month ago. Um, so that's been a very interesting uh, sort of editorial exploration uh, just day by day as we as we all experience history so um, uh, I think if you if you get a copy yourself you'll see that some of these pieces which were all written before the pandemic um, have so many elements that we can relate to in a different way in terms of solitude um, the the piece by Janana at the beginning of the last section uh, you can see this sort of the solitude uh, with this crab uh, in a different way and we have a lot of a lot of pieces featuring people who are alone but not quite alone um, in the issue so uh, let us um, look at a few more of these poems that you've been submitting so uh, for the people who just arrived uh, since I introduced the section um, we have been running a weekend long contest for 10 word poems which uh, are celebrating our 10th anniversary and the winner of the uh, contest um, receives a voucher to purchase any issue or basically whatever you want from from the sand website but we are also reading them out to share with the uh, virtual audience over the course of the weekend so one of them that we received uh, which is by uh, Dina Rosen mispronounced mother's food I try, but it tastes of loss. Uh, and she writes, Growing up, I couldn't speak my late mother's first language. Recently, I tried to cook a dish from my childhood and was consumed with grief. We also had um, a few that came in, uh, one uh, just during this session and another uh, last, late last night that relate to the coronavirus. Um, one of them by Shujat Mirza uh, is fear is the deterrent in the realm of unknown calamity sorry fear is the deterrence in the realm of unknown calamity uh, and um, the comment about it was it speaks about COVID-19 and the un uncertain times where fear saves us rather surprisingly um, and also I saw in the middle of this session, my father um, submitted a poem as well. Um, I am trapped inside my house, so I won't die. And I thought that was very direct. Um, and I think it's something we're all experiencing in different ways. Uh, so, so there's something about the international community that um, Sand represents that feels different now as well because uh, so many people around the world are experiencing the same crisis in different ways different localized ways and um, and so just as we normally celebrate this this occasion every time we we launch a new issue we celebrate it in berlin that means that we can't include so many of our international contributors and now um, in a way we all are coming together through this strange virtual medium um, so our poetry editor Krista Siglin uh, wrote the introduction for the next section um, but uh, I, I will read it for her and uh, yeah we're very excited for the second half of this session um, and then afterwards I will uh, just check in with you to say goodbye but we have another panel later today with former editors of, uh, of SAND, as well as myself and uh, our current managing editor, Simone O'Don O'Donovan, essentially discussing um, what the literary community, uh, how, how the formats that we organize in and how we, um, how we have made this thing work on a shoestring budget for 10 years, and, um, and, and we're, still, we're still going. Um, so uh, so it would be great if you're interested in that to join us. We also have another uh, panel, uh, sort of a set of features next uh, tomorrow.
with various of our editors, as well as another session um, similar to the one now and um, the one last night with some more of the issues contributors tomorrow. Okay, so uh, so I will introduce now the next the next set of readers and performers. Our first reader, Brad Garber, has degrees in biology, chemistry, and law. He writes, paints, draws, photographs, and hunts for mushrooms and snakes in the great northwest of the U.S. He is a 2011, 2013, and 2018 Pushcart Prize nominee. His piece, Anxiety, is a grotesquely beautiful, tactful meeting of grief and flurried manic energy staring each other down from a cold distance. Waverly SM is a writer living in Oxford, England. They write about apocalypses, impossible questions, ambivalent universes, fraught queer romances, and the ambient trauma of living in the world. They're a 2019 Lambda Literary Fellow by way of the Writers' Retreat for Emerging LGBTQ Voices, where they were mentored by Benjamin uh, Alire Saenz. Their poem, Entreaty to the Rattlesnake Population of Griffith Park, brilliantly pushes us through a devil-may-care desire for contact that is both brusque and tender, with earnesty ringing, ringing through the initially combative tone. The next reader, Larry Brown, lives in Brantford, Ontario, Canada. His story collection, Talk, was published by Oberon Press, and he recently completed his new story collection, Curtain, which is spelled K-U-R-T-I-N. He teaches writing workshops throughout Ontario, and his short story, Sandbar, is a sad and lovely illustration of the isolation that is possible, even when amongst loved ones, and how in grief, shock, or grim anticipation of a mystery, you can, quote, feel the train before you hear it. After that, we have a piece from Rukmini Kalamangalam, a first-gen American page and performance poet from Houston, Texas, in the U.S. She is a current sophomore at Emory University. In 2019, she was named Youth Poet Laureate of the Southwest, as well as Houston Youth Poet Laureate. Her poem, On Summer Days, My Mother Gardens, set the t sets the garden as a stage for both life and death as characters in the same deep breath. In this setting, we are, to, we are let loose to explore our understanding of the nature, in nature and family ties that holds us there. Um, also, I should say that uh, Krista, one of our poetry editors, and with Mini Kalamangalam, uh, will be having a longer conversation uh, tomorrow as part of the feature um, with the editors. And uh, Rukmini is incredibly eloquent, so I really recommend checking that one out. Um, the set will close with a video by Siru Wen, a visual artist from Dalian, China. Her practice is at the intersection between video installation, film, and photography. Siru's video installation has, has received the Award of Excellence at the Larnaca Biennale and has been exhibited at the Korean Cultural Center in Los Angeles. In You See the, Women, the, the Woman, we are gently placed in a domestic scene in which the tempo is perforated with both peace and a quiet distress. The body and the objects of the rooms mark the passage of time in a way that beautifully com complicates the surface of tedium. Um, and so now uh, let's start the next section and I'll see you in a little bit. Well, here we are in the middle of a pandemic and uh, my hair isn't as beautiful as it usually is, but um, my poem, uh, Anxiety, was accepted for publication, and so um, uh, we're going to read that for you for the Sand Journal when it comes out. Um, it's a prose poem, <clears throat> and uh, I don't know it by heart. I'm not a performance artist, so uh, bear with me here. I might slip up on a word or two, but the poem is called Anxiety. It is the thumbnail chewed to the nub one nibble away from blood, the way the penis reacts to stone, hair blowing away after radiation, a broken leg pointing in a new direction, pen falling to the floor, torn paper, a nail through the foot, and hand. How many times air fills the gut to bursting? How many times the shadows pass 
through the brain, a heart beating like a marimba band in syncopated rhythms, broken hips lurching in alleyways, the chipped tooth and wax-filled ear, separated eyeball hanging by a nerve, and a curling tongue all this while sweat swizzles out of small wells and skin valleys to drip over the lip and down across a starved and bulbous belly still healing from wounds of war. How shrapnel grazed the developing mind like a bat shadow chasing sucking insects so much broken glass across a naked floor and strings of the guitar in the corner snapping in heat like jaws of a turtle across the back of a fish the way egg is never correctly cooked waiting for the final word and shaking hand or a report of death in early morning echoes of fists against the thinning door large spiders bouncing through air like kites in search of open throats and tunnel ears dark urine flowing the beach becoming stone and homes like ships floating out to horizons at the edge of an eclipse the sun constantly dying in an unfathomably cold distance. And that, my friends, is anxiety. Hope all is well. Hi, I'm Waverly SM, and this is Entreaty to the Rattlesnake Population of Griffith Park. Hey, come fuck me up, I'm out here waiting. Juicy ass veins empty, bereft of venom. Like, there's a gap in the market here, lads, for some of that sweet snake bite dying. Don't you want an easy win? Can't be easy for you out here, wildfires, etc. Who even cares about snakes except to warn off terrorists? Like, caution would have done me any type of good, so get after it, okay? Time's a wasting, skin peeling like overripe fruit and don't you want to bury your teeth? Pinion my dumb meandering heart to my body with pain. But what good were all the warnings if you won't even show when I'm really asking? Like, I'm up. I'm swiping right. I'm yours. I was always yours. God, where are you? Please. Greetings from Brantford, Ontario, Canada. My name is Larry Brown. Today I'm going to be reading from my piece of flash fiction called Sandbar. And it's going to be one of the stories in the upcoming issue of Sand Journal. So don't delay, get your copy today. The sky sprays sunlight. I sit on a blanket eating a cheese sandwich. First time I've been out of the lake since we arrived at Port Darling an hour ago. My parents sit facing straight ahead in their folding chairs, sort of like strangers on a bus. Two weeks and three days and I'll be 13, clearly and cleanly a teenager. My father stands up. Okay, he says. My mother takes a slow drink from her chipped but unbreakable cup. Her Hollywood sunglasses black out her eyes. Ready to part the waters, are we? She says. My father shrugs off his shirt. He wears trunks, not a bathing suit. Don't try telling him any differently. The sun has darkened his arms up to the elbows like a pair of long gloves. Then pasty white takes over. Wiry hairs here and there. I get up from the blanket. Stay here, eat, my father says. He gives me a look, one that sags at the edges, one that makes me turn away, look for my mother. There is a sandbar today, and as my father wades farther out, the water remains at his knees. Wake me when you get back, I hear my mother say. She comments for her own ears a lot more lately. The water climbs higher on him, the sandbar done. He looks one way, then the other, as if checking for traffic. He faces away from the beach, arms flat to his sides, almost at attention. Then my father, all of them, slips down into the water. 
The sun stares hard at me. I can kind of hear it buzz. Where, says my mother, is your father? I never will have the right answer to that. But she tells the police he was wearing a navy blue swimsuit. Trunks, I want to yell. Later, much later, I will learn that the men in this family leave behind questions, not notes. Just like my father's father, I will take a walk to where the bushes part. Standing there, you feel the train before you hear it. I know. Thank you. On summer days, my mother gardens. On summer days, my mother gardens as if we are empty. As if inside us both, there is not a mouth. Hungry. Sour with the taste of a leaving sickness. We bury our fingers and watch them return long and cut by the sides of a lemongrass leaf. We bury sickness and watch it return. Seeds stringy and bloody, rot blooming eyes. We watch a child grow slanted from the earth. She knows how to salivate for dead things, bursts tomatoes fatly in her mouth. Child watches buffaloes swell for days. When cut open, the death has birthed children, dogs with hungry eyes, big winged birds cackling and pecking, worms that tunnel beneath her fingernails. Child is sticky. Child hosts worm, sickness. Child knows she asked a golden mother to bring the harvest. An art teacher showed us how to make pots before she went to jail. We do not go to class. We make dirt from the yard into balls that we press our thumbs into. We complain. Worms in the soil leave cracks when the pot dries. Her son's pills were beneath the seat in her zero tolerance, no place for hate car. When she comes back, she will show us how to pull the worms out of clay or else let them fry crisp blackly in the kiln. Look, the pink-throated lizard in its greenery, in its nascence. We greened once, beautiful on a wooden fence, climbing the snow pea trellis. We tilled the ground summer and fall. We swatted mosquito, squirrel from feast, feasted. We wound tendrilled vines around post in preparation for winter. Since the child came, it's always been summer. Mint eats and eats, curry leaves browning under a bloated sun. Child is good at waiting, feels water stagnant between her toes, ants biting as they drown in hose pools. Child doesn't move even when mosquito arrives, lets mosquito burst fat with blood. Child kills it then, and then all our blood is ours again, spit back from the soil's full mouth.
Hi everyone. Um, thanks for sticking around. Yeah, we're um, we're so happy to have all these people in in the journal. It's it's really great to see um, the actual faces behind these texts that we've been looking at and designing and and proofreading for all of these months. Um, yeah, so uh, we are just about done with this session. Um, I just wanted to uh, remind you all about this upcoming panel we have um, this afternoon or early evening Berlin time in a few hours. Um, we are celebrating 10 years and it's difficult to explain what that means to someone who is not involved in literary journals, but um, if, if a dog year is a seventh of a human year, then um, maybe a literary journal year is even faster than that, um, because um, unfortunately there are so many different um, obstacles to, to surviving. Um, it's, it's really not a profitable enterprise, and um, especially in a city like Berlin, where we have so many people coming and going all the time, um, which is partly um, what makes our city so vibrant and so exciting uh, when things are actually open. But, uh, but it also means that we've, we've had a huge amount of, um, of turnover over the years. We've had about 80 different people um, on the same team in, in the last 21 issues. And so, um, so we've all had to learn how to pass things on to each other. Um, I also wasn't the founder myself. I, I was the fourth editor in chief. Um, I've been doing this for a few years now. And we've all brought different things to the table and we've all learned different things. Um, and so I think it, it, it feels like really a miracle to watch what um, the people before me all put together and, and sort of handed to me when, um, when I became editor in chief. Um, but also there have been all kinds of different ideas and different um, contributions that have, that have made this journal happen as it is uh, over the years. And, and I really just want to appreciate the people um, who made that happen. So this afternoon we will um, be discussing some of the strategies that uh, enabled us to survive um, to 10 years, which maybe is um, 150 journal years. <laughs> um, and uh, I'll be doing that with uh, my predecessor, Liz Pfister, um, Greg Nissen, the former poetry editor, um, and uh, Simone O'Donovan, who's uh, the current ma uh, managing editor, and um, Becky Crook, Becky L. Crook, who is our founder who started this whole thing. And uh, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to that and I hope um, some of you will join us for it. Um, other than that, if you enjoyed the presentations, um, please do check out our website and um, consider pre-ordering the print copy so you can hold it in your hands or if you can't wait that long, you can order a PDF and um, get it right now. And uh, we look forward to seeing you some more over the rest of the weekend. Thanks so much.